senior thesis here at Maryville College, and I teamed up with my sister, uh, a fellow uh, Maryville College student named <laughs> <laughs> uh, She wrote all the original music that you'll hear tonight, and it's really some beautiful music. Uh, this is the culmination of a year and a half of research, and these students, everything you're going to see tonight on this stage was written, directed, uh, designed, built and acted all by Maryville College students. And I think it says something very special about Maryville College that a bunch of students came together to put on something to celebrate our history. And it shows that rich connection that Maryville College has, especially in this bicentennial year. And I think that's very special. And without uh, further ado, enjoy Sturdy as a Rock. in the autumn of 1810 with the Scots-Irish Anderson family of Rockbridge County, Virginia, traveling all across the mountains in search of abundant land and a better life. Isaac Anderson, 19 years old, traveled with his family to a new land beyond the mountains, Knox County, in the five-year-old state of Tennessee. He's very impressive. Trust us. He always had a hunger for learning and a faithful heart. He absorbed every lesson he heard from his parents, pastor, or teacher. Isaac Anderson knew from a young age that he was destined to be a servant of God. He lived his life in constant prayer, always studying his Lord's word. He was quickly on his way to becoming one of the most famous Presbyterian ministers on the frontier. His sermons were legendary, and in such great demand that he rode a 150-mile circuit once a month on horseback to preach the word to the most remote mountain communities. If one reads the gospel with a sincere eye, he finds that the Lord instructs us to do good, act benevolently, but not for our own sake. We are to disregard our benevolence, be uh, free from selfish want and personal gain. I have never found myself more acceptable to my master than I was standing, preaching to those hearers in the wilderness, spreading the word of God. There is not one thing I afford in this world more than idleness or idle people. We are immortal until our work is done. Bring us closer to 
every day, Isaac Anderson wrote to his next church, even in the saddle. He worked tirelessly to write his sermons. It's a bit Everywhere he went, he relied on the kindness of his confidence for a place to sleep and food to eat. It was a loathsome and taxing work. For I am tired in the Lord's work, but I am not tired of it. Everywhere he went, he brought the word of God to hungry ears. Please turn to your hymns, 231. Find grace in me. Lord, we ask you for your blessing. Give us eyes so we might see. And though we be but sinners, let us find grace in thee. May our words, our thoughts, our actions prove holy in thy sight. May step upon thy journey. Bring us closer to your light. His work never ceased. He brought countless men and women to Christ alone. But something was lacking. Anderson longed for a, a stable position in a community church where he could preach every Sunday and be a spiritual leader to all his congregants every day. Lord, in you all things were made and all things created. Lord, I come to you now as your humble servant, not worthy, not worthy, but ready to serve you all my life. My life I've lived in service to you, Lord. Help my fellow man grow closer to your word. Though each soul I save is precious, have I done all that I should? Help me, God, help me, Lord, to do good. my life I've tried to follow your commands. Help my friends and neighbors wherever I can. But if you just give me an answer, I'd go, Father, yes I would. Help me, God, help me, Lord, to do good. enough to help one person? Is it enough to save one soul? Oh, to do your work, oh Lord, must I reach a larger goal? Lord, I ask you for your blessing. Give me eyes that I might see. And though I am a sinner, help me find Blackbird. How do you know who I am? I'm Isaac Anderson. I'm a Presbyterian minister just like you. Oh, yeah. You're that saddlebag preacher I've heard so much about. And you're Reverend Gideon <coughs> Blackbird. You preach to the largest Presbyterian church on the entire frontier. New Providence. In Maryland. I've read all your sermons. An admirer, I see. Is it true that you're planning on leaving your pastor soon, sir? Well, where'd you hear that? Presbyterians can't keep a secret. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am leaving soon. Well, where are you going? Faith alone is a powerful thing, but it's unstoppable when paired with a thorough education. I'm headed west, Illinois, to start a school. Well, who do you have planned to take over your pastor when you're gone? No one from the northern seminaries willing to come here to the frontier to preach. Well, are you sure that there's... Nobody acceptable here, sir? Impossible. I need a seminary man, so seek one of them from one of the northern seminaries. You're certain that there's nobody here? Why? You know someone? 
I might. I might know somebody very well. <laughs> Me. <laughs> You're very young. But with youth comes endurance. I'm very strong in the saddle. I ride all through the heats of the summer and the winds and the snows of the winter. And I know that I'm the perfect man for this charge. <coughs> Sir? I need someone well versed in literature. You even gone to a seminary? Yes, I studied under Reverend Samuel Brown in Lexington, Virginia for many years, and I believe that every day is a day for learning. I could read the easier Latin poets by age seven. A new providence would make a real difference by guiding an entire community spirit towards the light of God every single day. But you are a circuit rider, not a real preacher. But that's what I want, sir. I want to make a lasting difference. All right, Reverend Anderson. Come cast your lot with the frontier folk. Come to Maribel. Lord, I'm ready now to follow where you lead. My heart is open, use it for your deeds. I'll go to this place you sent me on the largest possible scale. Lord, I'll try, no, I'll prevail and do good. My mission to do good on the largest possible scale. But you already are! Duty imperiously bids me to go to Maryland. I apologize, but please know that this decision has been made with the expectation of making a worldly difference. Please, Dr. Manning, let's talk to not be Scott Cyrish. <laughs> <laughs> What's your name, sir? Henry Tedford. Born and raised him. <laughs> and you? I see you. <laughs> oh, you're the good preacher, man. You're not supposed to be here till tomorrow. I couldn't wait to get started. Oh, well, it's a pleasure to meet you. Oh, and everyone is so excited to meet you. The reference here, y'all. Now, we're all real friendly. We just want you to feel right at home. In fact, I'm in charge of the welcoming committee here. <laughs> welcoming committee? Oh, let me show you around. Are you sure you're feeling up to this? Oh, you'd be surprised how fast I can get sober when a pastor wakes me up. <laughs> <laughs> I've got something to say. Yes, sir. Here in Maribel, we like things just the way they are. As do I. If you're born here, you'll die here, because we don't travel far. <laughs> you know, I know you come from yonder to tell us tales of our God. So we welcome you, Mr. Anderson, to our communidad. Yeah. Woo! In this old town, we shake hands with everyone we meet. I've known her 30 years. Still, that's the problem. This old town, we teach our kids to respect the poor and rich. And if they get it wrong, then Granny hits them with a switch. <laughs> 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 now, 
in this old town. In this old town, we take pride in everything we got. Don't steal your fella's horse. Or girl. Or else you could get shot. In this old town, we know exactly how things are to be. And there's a special place in hell for those who drink unsweetened tea. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you laughing? I think it's funny. What is? Well, all this talk about grass. What's your name, miss? Laura McCampbell, sir. It's nice to meet you, Miss McCampbell. My mother's Greta McCampbell. My poppy died in an Indian raid last spring. I've been helping keep the farm running. Mother does the cooking and cleaning, and I plow the fields. Impressive. I enjoyed your sermon this morning. Oh, you did? Well, how do you preach so? With going on and on and on about something. I mean, it's impressive to say the least, but I don't think I understood a bit of it. You didn't understand it. Well, what verse did you preach on? Matthew 6, 28, the lilies of the field. Yeah. Consider the lilies of the field. How they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And if God so clothed the grass of the field, and today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, Shall he not much more clothe you? What does that mean? But to understand, you must first understand the author. Same with preachers in their sermons? Yes, exactly. But who said this? Well, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. He's reassuring us that we are all equal creations of his, and that everything is divinely orchestrated. Like the grass. <laughs> if I go into a shop, and I see all the nicely finished wheels, gears, and pinions of a watch just spread out on a table, and I come back later just to find them put together, working in unison to move the hand across the dial to show the passage of time. Do I think that they were all put together by blind chance? No. No, certainly not. I think that somebody with thought and plan and power put them together. They're a divine intelligence. <laughs> and that's what the world is. Just a perfectly calibrated watch built by God himself. You're an amazing teacher, Reverend Anderson. Have you thought about teaching students here? I've only just arrived. I, I haven't really given it much thought. Well, you've got a talent. Like you've been made for it. Like God's design. My daddy used to say about the mountains that you closer <laughs> to God up here. All my life I've lived in these mountains finally become quite clear. Up here there's a spirit that surrounds you in the trees and the air and the sun. And each flower 
that grows on the mountain, you can see the face of God. It's like the face of God. Why not open a school here in Maryville? A school? Are we getting a little ahead of ourselves? You have what it takes. Yes, it's true of us folks on the mountain that we're not quite up to speed. But I think that you'll find a little teaching is all that we really need. For although I'm not school just as you are, can find my name with any sort of speed, still I trust in the Lord of these mountains. her husband and his ministry, striving to bring their community ever closer to God. The Scotch-Irish belief that the purpose of education is to understand ourselves first by becoming moral and ethical citizens. His law college offered a thorough liberal arts education. One of his most notable and least serious pupils was the future governor and president of Texas, Sam Houston. Well, why don't you teach us something useful for a change? And I learned more from Cherokees than him! <laughs> Sam, I can no longer allow you to keep interrupting me while I'm teaching and impeding the further learning of the other students. Please go. You remember the Alamo! <laughs> Get off me! Sam Houston was expelled from Anderson's Law College after only four days of instruction. <laughs> this was the beginning of Isaac Anderson's educational legacy, but this was not the beginning of Maryville College. The classroom was his natural post, and the new Providence pulpit was his throne. <laughs> but he never felt more useful to his Lord than when he ministered his congregants one-on-one. -on -one. this week that I've interrupted you. <laughs> Why are you doing this? Well, I don't know. My wife's been visiting her family for weeks, and I get lonely. So, what else am I supposed to do? You're supposed to show restraint. Kneel with me. Oh, holy love. 
Tedford? Yes, it was the third time this week, but I think we made a real breakthrough this time. You can't keep doing this to yourself, Isaac. You're driving yourself into exhaustion. We are immortal until our work is done. Where can you find more ministers? I suppose in one of the northern seminaries. Then go there and bring them back. You can't do this by yourself. Why would good, learned, pious men want to come down here to the edge of the beyond? Why did you think of the difference many men could make? My dear, it's time to leave the mountains. Go change the world. Help us grow. I'll stay here and watch over the mountains. But you Denomination, only young, learned, pious men to come with me to Tennessee. Who will join me? <laughs> the lands beyond the mountains are ripe for the harvest. I need young men to come help me reap the fields and bring them into salvation. Oh, how much is a peg? What kind of question is that? <coughs> what a sensible one. <laughs> Listen to me, brothers. Only 3% of Tennesseans can, are, are able to read the gospel, and mostly from illiterate men. I'm not risking my life. In Indian territory for nothing. Exactly. Well, I, I administer to the charity, and they are some of the most capable and generous. Do you hear this? Oh, what? A, a minister's only purpose is to do good on the largest possible scale. For that, you have failed. So have I. Good on the largest possible scale. Do good on. Reverend Anderson. Reverend Anderson, I want to come with you. Reverend Anderson, may I please join you? Settle up, boy. It's better to return with one than none at all. We rode southward towards Maryland, Tennessee, from Princeton, New Jersey, over the Allegheny, across the Susquehanna River, and down the Shenandoah Valley. They made their way back on primitive roads and cattle trails. On the 22nd day of their journey, Anderson had an idea. Those men of God are more interested in making money than serving our Lord. I bet they wouldn't come down and preach to us even if we asked them to. No, if we want learned ministers, we're going to have to build them up ourselves. A seminary. That's the only way we can fix it. I barely know how to preach. I don't know how to teach. Uh, they're the same thing. A seminary? <laughs> when did you come up with this idea? Back in Princeton. Oh. <laughs> and I've decided that you're the perfect man for the job. Me? Yes. You're a very devout man. You're very capable. Your grades back in Princeton were exemplary. And I've noticed that you don't regret a single thing that you do. At the seminary. Where are we building? In Maryville. I agree with you, but this is a big undertaking. We need a plan. Well, that's what we're doing now, Lamar. What about money? Well, you can handle the finances, and I'll, I'll be the professor. Yes, my seminarians will have to come in with their heads as empty as a barrel. Their entire systems of theology, which they thought were removable, will have to be destroyed and built up from scratch. But I assure you, Lamar, we will create seminarians worthy of serving God. Seminary in Maryville? That's, that's just crazy enough to work. Are you in, <laughs> Professor Lamar? I'm in. <coughs> but where will we get the funding? I'll petition the Senate. <laughs> <laughs> Right. You want us to fund this pet project of yours? Yes, there are not enough learned ministers on the, on the frontier to help lead people to salvation. A great need, President Barnum. Spit it Barnum. out, Anderson. We don't have time for you to be long-winded. Exactly. I have traveled to the many great northern seminaries to persuade men to the cause, but none have answered the call. The only way to get the, se the ministers we need is to build them up ourselves. We want to start a seminary here in Maryville. I thought you said no one accepted the call. You did right. say that. Gentlemen, shall I introduce you? 
Professor Thomas Jefferson Lamar, my partner in this endeavor. He looks barely old enough to drink. Professor Anderson found me at Princeton where I've just graduated. Oh, well, Princeton? He'll handle the finances while I teach the school. We're a mighty team, gentlemen. Theological seminary in the southern and western territory. What would you name it? The Southern and Western Theological Seminary. Oh. <laughs> I'm surprised those Nelson folk have the ability to read. Oh. They're actually some of the most capable and pious of individuals. Do they, do they even wear shoes? Oh. <laughs> Where did you get your seminary degrees? Up north. Exactly the reason we should start one here on the frontier. Carry on teaching them in your home like you've been doing. And your frontier can help. My small homestead cannot sustain the endeavor that I intend to pursue. We need a proper campus. Well, have you found one? I intend to build one. With what funds? Well, with your assistance. No! Oh, no, 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 over in Murphy's no, or even in Knoxville. Reverend Carrick yes. already has a college right over there. I believe that Maryville is a proper location. Jim, do they even have teams? This is the opportunity to build something for the benefit of everyone on the frontier. We support your mission work with the mountain folk. Oh, heart. Oh, yes. Just not financially. Uh, <laughs> gentlemen, please consider our proposal. This is a chance to have our own seminary. With this seminary, we can greatly increase the Christian presence on the frontier. The answer is no, Reverend Anderson. Of course. I'm sorry, Reverend Anderson. We can't help you. Thank you for your time. The chance to change the world is given to them, and they refuse to put their trust in the Lord. And they call themselves men of God. I mean, our plan does sound ambitious, sir. What do we need them for? They're the seminary. We can build our own seminary. No building, no books, no school committee. You don't need a school committee or trustees or books or governors or even lumber. All you need is minds that give and minds that receive. I think the majority of people around here don't know how to read. So we have them. They don't have the prerequisite knowledge to enter a seminary. We'll just have to build up their foundations. We'll build a college to prepare them for the seminary, and then a preparatory school to prepare them for the college. You're talking about three different schools. Yes, I'm afraid so. Not just the seminary anymore, but three. Exactly. But we have no money. We've always trusted in the Lord, and all we can do is His work. All we can do is good. This is good. What do we have to invest? What we've always had. Ourselves. Thomas Jefferson Lamar and Isaac Anderson quickly began their work. On October 19, 1819, the Southern and Western Theological Seminary officially opened its doors to the first of its students. Students, this is truly a historic day, a day that shall live beyond present comprehension. So shall we begin with the syllabus? Comprehensive <laughs> education. And I expect you to strive for mastery. Do you understand? <coughs> Yes, Dr. Anderson. Good. Each day I will give you a subject to study and write about. You will then find two authors that view wildly on the subject. I will then give you my views on the matter. And then you will answer your theological question book. If you answer correctly, you shall be passed on. If not, I will give you my proofs, my reason, and my biblical truth on the matter. And if you still cannot see the truth, then I urge you to study more thoroughly in prayer. Oh, gosh. Do you guys want to go to a tavern after this? Uh -huh. <laughs> the students will be expected to attend both morning, evening, and midday worship services. Okay. There will be no dice games, card games, well, well, wait, 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 or what? intoxication. Well, what? <laughs> you will not be seen at taverns in unruly hours, and most importantly, there will not be no dancing with women at any time. What? Is what? what? Yes. The education of the moral youth is a danger to society because the increase of knowledge, the corrupt heart, only adds power to wickedness. You will be expected to answer to God for your conduct and your beliefs, and you will be punished as such. When the school started, the tuition was $25 a year, but the students were few, and most of them could only pay a small part of the fees. Purpose, but not funds. The Andersons provided room and board for several 
just as much as a teacher to us, these students as her husband was. Many of them were very far from home, and she took them in as sons of her own. Your sermon this morning was splendid, dear. I think I read a paragraph twice. I must have lost my place. Nobody noticed. Once nobody noticed, then nobody was listening. <laughs> Maybe they thought you did it for emphasis. Did you see that gentleman in the front row with his eyes closed? You don't think he was sleeping, do you? <laughs> he was concentrating. <laughs> I'll make you suffer, darling. You keep grading your papers. Professor Lamar, how are you? I've been better. I have some pressing matters that I need to discuss with you. Well, what is it? Well, as you know, our school is rapidly outgrowing our facilities. <laughs> yes. We can't keep teaching in the shanty of a house. We need to build a proper campus with a great school building. So we will. Isaac Anderson asked his congregation to help in the construction of a new school building. self-sacrificing labor of Dr. Anderson and Professor Lamar. Ah, uh, sorry to bother you. I fear I've come to talk to you about something rather dire. It's about the college finances. What about them? They're non-existent. <laughs> <laughs> Five. You've always put our trust in Yes, and you've done so for many years, but I fear I might have to ask you to do something very important. Yes? 
I fear I need a man to travel throughout the land to collect money to sustain us in endowment. Will you be the financial ambassador of the college? Preaching for Christian goodness, and maybe people will donate to our cause. Make a circuit of it. What? We started this school with five students in a log cabin, and now we have hundreds of students on our registrar, and many out there spreading knowledge and good. Trust in me and the Lord, Lamar. Turn with the funds. I will, I Professor Lamar left Maribel College and began his tour of the South. He conducted church services and evangelistic meetings, soliciting funds for the college. We need to teach the young and rising generation to refine the public taste, to pour the light of science into our rising colleges and academies, and to impart the lessons of sacred wisdom from his holy death. He traveled 7,000 miles by train. At Maribel College, we make resilient and pious students. Could you please bear a bit? No amount is too small. He took no salary. Mr. Hawkins, I cannot begin to tell you how painful it is for me to stand here and beg for money. But Maribel College must remain. Why? Because it must. Professor, we are having a great deal of difficulty supporting our own school. How can you expect us to donate to yours 800 miles away? It's a miracle spirit that sets us apart, Mr. Daniels. It's our Yes, news. yes, I'm sorry, but a token gift of ten dollars is all we can do. Ten dollars for one kind of seat from anyone else. Thank you. You seem to forget, Mr. Lamar. Times are tough for us, too. We can make a little go a long way, Miss Woodward. Just a few dollars is all I'm asking. I'm sorry, Mr. Lamar. The answer is no. <laughs> Thank you for your time. He only secured $125, while the expense of the trip was $198. On his return to Maryville, a downhearted Lamar stopped in Danville, Kentucky for the night. Sir, I apologize for imposing, but if you'd be so gracious as to supply a room for me, please. I'm a man of God, I've exhausted all my resources. And it's only for one night. Can't make exceptions. It'll be two dollars, sir. Don't you worry about the cost, preacher. I've got it. You're a gracious Christian indeed. I'm Professor Lamar from Maryville College. Oh yeah, over Knoxville ways. I know Maryville. It's really beautiful over there, I say. Thank you. It's a place touched by God, sir. Happy to make your acquaintance, Professor Lamar. Now, <coughs> I'm the mayor of this town, and may I ask, Maryville College is a school of prophets? Yes, a college, preparatory school, and seminary, all in one. See, that's what a town needs. A noble God and force leading an entire community's spirits towards the light of God. It's not a profitable endeavor, I'll tell you that. Has it been hard financially for y'all? Unless a charitable soul offers some funds soon, I'm afraid we haven't the capital to continue much longer. Professor Lamont, I've got a proposition for you. Now it just so happens that we've been pondering the prospect of opening a college of our own right here in Danville. Now I'd make sure your door stayed open, classrooms packed with pupils, and enough money to keep those pockets warm. What do you say? Professor Lamar thought this might be the change the college needed to survive. I don't know, sir. We've done so much work back in Maryland. Professor Lamar, I'd be willing to offer 140 scholarships at $240 each and build the seminary a proper building on a lot right next to the Presbyterian church. No one else had offered them any help, and this was the most gracious gift they'd ever received. Well, what about the people in Maribel? I can't just abandon this them. This could be an opportunity for your college to grow, to continue to touch people's lives. In this old town, we hunger for God's word the way it is. We haven't had a chance, you're the first preacher to come through. Take it as a sign, it's time for you to listen to God's call. You just might find that this old town is not so different after all. What do you say? Come on down. Come to this town. Thomas Jefferson Lamar agreed to the mayor's proposal to move Maryland College to Danville, Kentucky. <laughs> 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 Professor Lamar suspected that Isaac Anderson would oppose this drastic change with no chance of a compromise. So, Lamar went zigzag all over the presbytery, collecting signatures for a petition to relocate the college. Every minister 
are signed, except Isaac Anderson. <clears throat> Hogwash! Isaac Anderson was crushed by the ingratitude of this contained. He struggled to believe that his trusted friend, his partner in mission, the one who had been there since the beginning, who helped make his dream become a strong reality, would betray him and their college so deeply. He swiftly wrote 19 reasons why the college should stay in Maryville and mailed it to every minister that signed Lamar's petition. Our roots have grown deep into the banks of Pistol Creek. This ground has nourished us for many years and shall till today. Our college's vision is that of the community's vision, and we shall not move from our spot beneath Shilhawi's lofty mountains. All the ministers quickly rescinded their signatures and expressed their desire for Maryville College to remain at its birthplace without any money. It's all fixed now. Please let it go. It was a mistake, but please don't be so hard on that. I've forgiven him for what he's done to me. I cannot forgive him for what he's done to my college. Dr. Anderson. Professor Lamar, before you begin, sir, please know that I didn't intend to hurt the college. I thought it was in our best interests. Oh. Ridiculous. Honey, please, don't lose your temper. I can't believe you went behind my back to betray the institution that we built from the ground up. New facilities where we can continue doing the same work we've been doing here. Only now it's room to grow. All we have to do is move northward. You have no idea how good that sounded after everything I've been through. You went around and got all the signatures in secret. You knew that was wrong. No, I knew you wouldn't agree. <coughs> you should open a whiskey still and see your life's work move just out of state. You're, you're right. You'll never let anyone but yourself make decisions. You're getting older, Isaac. You need, to let, you need to give us some control and let others take up the charge. I will not let my school be ran by a man of such little faith. I've always trusted in the Lord to provide, and the Lord has always provided. Who's to say that Dan will is in God's way of providing? I'm to say. Honey, he, he tried to help. He had the noblest intentions. Were Judas's intentions noble? Dear. Why won't you ever listen to anyone but yourself? <laughs> I know what is right in the Lord, and I will not allow my college to be taken away. Not taken, just move. The people up in Danville have the same hunger for God as we do in Maryville. We can't survive this long here. Danville offers us a larger sphere of action. You mistake your faithlessness with ingenuity. I have always trusted in the Lord to provide, and the Lord We has don't all... have the money to continue here. It's that simple. What other choice do we have? I know what is right for my college. No, you think you know what is right for the college. A good man should humbly listen to everyone who is inclined to share. How else can you hear the call of God, no matter how he speaks? Isaac Anderson, arguably the greatest orator on the frontier, was at a loss for words for the first time in his life. I'm sorry, Isaac. Hogwash! Anderson was forced to sell off a portion of his farm to keep the college operation. He continued to trust in the Lord to provide, but his pace quickly slowed. Without Professor Lamar's assistance, the workload quickly wore him down. Dr. Anderson suffered a severe stroke from which he never recovered. He remained seated while teaching. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, how they toil not, and neither do they spin. Therefore, take no thought in saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have all need for these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. By 1856, Isaac Anderson was almost totally incapacitated in body and in mind. He was president and pastor in name only, and his church and college declined sharply. School attendance dropped to an all-time low. The seminary department was permanently closed due to a lack of students, and mathematics was dropped from the curriculum due to a lack of funds. To 
The railroads made it easier for young men to travel to other institutions that have now been established. Eventually, the elderly Isaac Anderson petitioned the Senate of Tennessee for a young, able man to carry on his altruistic dream of education. The Senate elected Reverend John Joseph Robinson from Atlanta, Georgia to be the next president of Maryville College. He found a school in decline and was determined to make changes. <laughs> <laughs> must be Dr. Robinson. And you must be Dr. Anderson. Or so much about you. They say no one has worked harder for our Lord than you, sir. Why, thank you, sir. That's, that's very flattering. Very flattering. Uh, welcome to Maryville College. It's a bit dusty, but I'll show you around. Please, sir. This is our first floor where we have our classrooms. And up this staircase is our college chapel. This is where students have the midday, morning, and evening worship services. All students must attend. All agreeable. Uh, Dr. Anderson, why is that black person holding the textbooks? Well, he's learning, sir. <laughs> how does he know how to read? I talk. You allow Negroes to attend this institution? I allow men of every race to study here, sir. We are all children of God. Not. But integration, sir. I am a friend to the African, to the Indian, and the foreigner of all lands. They are all brothers to me. Do they at least have separate classrooms? Black, white, woman, or man, they all study together, sir. I appreciate your ideal, Dr. Anderson. Don't get me wrong, but not everyone agrees with them. It's obvious why this college is in decline. I'm here, too. Revive this college. Do you support the secession of the southern states, Dr. Roberts? I'm a Georgian, <laughs> through and through. I will follow where my brothers will go. Do you support the institution of slavery? Dr. Robinson. The church is not commissioned to interfere with the relation to a king and his subjects, or a master to his slaves. We must instruct them of their mutual duties the, according to the gospel. The union is the sole savior of the world and promises under God to rid it of religious and civil tyranny. And any man who talks of dissolving the union should be hanged. And if he speaks of it, he deserves a far worse fate. You speak boldly, Dr. Anderson. I ask God to send me a man that's worthy of my replacement. He sends me you. <laughs> Isaac Anderson had no choice but to leave his position as the president of Maryville College to Reverend John Joseph Robinson. He retired from the ministry and college, finally able to rest after a lifetime of exhausting labor. With Maryville College led by another man for the first time in its history, Isaac Anderson died peacefully in his bed beside his wife. He was buried two days later in the old New Providence Cemetery under the shade of a magnolia tree. I come before you today to address the looming depression upon our community. Our beloved spiritual leader, Reverend Dr. Isaac Anderson passed away last night after a prolonged struggle with illness. If anyone fulfilled their Christian potential, it was Isaac Anderson. With such division growing between our brothers, now more than ever, we need noble Christians with unwavering convictions for the common good. I am honored to carry on his work here at Maryville College. Goodbye, Dr. Anderson. Your work shall not die with you. Servant of God, well done. Rest with thy love employed. The battle fought, the victory won. Enter thy master's joy. Our Father, Lord. Without 
Anderson's influence, President Robinson repealed Maribel's commitment to integration. He increased enrollment, but this time with only white male students. President Robinson was certain in his Southern loyalties, but that did not mean that there wasn't a singular opinion amongst the students. Debates were common. There were instances of hostility and bitterness in the boarding house. The Confederate students were hot-blooded and hasty, and the Union students were slow to anger, but very stubborn. <laughs> Conflicts exploded on April 12, 1861, when Confederate artillery fired at the Union garrison in Fort Sumter, South Carolina. Confederate cannon boldly announced that this war was not going to be easy. Cannon fire was heard as far away as there were igniting tempers off campus. For the mutual sake of God, I implore you to restrain your emotions. For this last brief period, we have the fortune to be together. As the president of Maryville College, I have no choice but to close this institution. But I'm so close to graduate. It breaks my heart that this institution, found on the love of God and the freedom of spirit, finds itself hopelessly divided and torn apart over mere human principles. Before we part today, I ask in his name that you look cross each other's eyes. Remember that these are your friends, your classmates, your brothers. Remember all the things you love in them, all the great memories you share with them. reminded Professor Lamar of Isaac Anderson's dream. Mr. Lamar? <coughs> oh, Miss Anderson, how are you this evening? I hate to disturb you at this hour, but I have something on my mind and I had to run over here at once. I had a dream. Dream? My Isaac came to me in a dream. Isaac came to you in a dream? He recited a verse from the Bible. From childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Continue to do so for others. 2 Timothy 3.15 was one of his favorite verses. Well, what do you think your dream means, Ms. Anderson? You must reopen the college. The college doesn't exist anymore. We have no students. They've all moved far away and were taken by the war. You can grow it back. We found the college and built it back up again. <laughs> Together, God brought you to these mountains. It wasn't easy, goodness knows. Still you trusted in the Lord of these mountains. Please. Let it close. Together we can finish what he started. Together we can help turn back the clock. Together we'll bring God back to these mountains. Together we can build it sturdy as a rock. Incredibly inspired, Professor Lamar single-handedly reopened the college. But there's drastic changes. Women were now admitted as full-time degree-earning college students. The first college in Tennessee to do so. 
Lamar repealed Robinson's exclusion of African American students. Blacks were educated here in the days of slavery. If there was no exclusion then by reason of race or color, then I see no adequate reason for there to be now. Yes. Yes. We deem it much to the credit of this institution that it has, from its genesis, stood upon Christian moral ethics, excluding none from its benefits by reason of race, color, or gender. The class was resumed in the ruins of the old brick college building which was ruined by the Civil War. There were no windows or doors. On the first day of classes, they had to stop the lesson to escort a cow who had wandered into the classroom. <laughs> In 1869, a brick wall collapsed overnight. This convinced Professor Lamar that it was time to relocate the college. Professor Lamar wrote Pittsburgh Industrialist. William Thaw wanted to procure a new campus. Harvard! Princeton! Maryville College! Yeah, I like this one. <laughs> Changing the college's name to Thaw College was briefly discussed, but never agreed upon. <laughs> With Thaw as benefactor, Professor Lamar moved the college to the East Hills. He planted the institution in fertile soil atop College Hill. Professor Lamar constructed a new school building in the center of the new campus, a practical recreation of the first brick college, Anderson Hall. Once again, the college bell tolled, calling her students home. Ladies and gentlemen, your presence is all the indication I need of your desire for an education. You shall have it. I, we have much to make up for, and with God's help, we will do it. The Lord will provide as he has before.
impossible scale. Our souls will fly just like that bird. All we have to do is try. To do. Come on over here, grab your tools and gear. Got no time to talk, gonna build it sturdy as a rock. Yes, we got a plan, doing all we can. Gotta beat the clock, gonna build it sturdy as a rock. Come on over here, grab your tools and gear. Got no time to talk, gonna build it sturdy as a rock. Yes, we got a plan, doing all we can. Gotta beat the clock, gonna build it sturdy as a rock. Come on over here, grab your tools and gear. Got no time to talk, gonna build it sturdy as a rock. Yes, we got a plan, doing all we can. Gotta beat the clock. 